really making uh, time uh, long, I will just introduce the first speaker, Wendy. Wendy uh, Hamelin, I will uh, talk, uh, read uh, something about uh, Wendy Hamelin, uh, so you will all uh, uh, know how interesting uh, uh, things she is doing. She studied Turkish studies and cultural anthropology at Leiden University and graduated in 2005. <laughs> she wrote her MA thesis on on the Turkish Ashik folk poets. In 2006, Wendy started her PhD research on Kurdish folk poets, Turkey, uh, uh, the Denji. Uh, she investigated how the Dengbej uh, uh, navigate between Kurdish attempts to preserve their culture and language and Turkish assimilation politics. The project focuses on the dynamics of an oral tradition and on the shifting cultural and political identities of its performance in a traditional Turkish Kurdish society. She, she is also setting up a dig, digital archive of the collected data that is incorporated in the archive of the Max Planck Institute in Nijmegen. Her research interests are the uh, performance of identity and politics in daily life, narrative construction of individual and collective identities, migration and experiences of displacement and loss, and phenomenology. Okay, now uh, uh, we will listen to her for 20 minutes. Thank you very much. I would first like to thank the organizers and the translators for this great conference. I feel honored to give a presentation here. The salvation of such complex issues of conflict and peaceful coexistence is not only important for Turkey, but for all people. It therefore has a much wider relevance. I worked on, this, on the research for this paper together with Hanefi Barish, who unfortunately could not be here, but to whom I am greatly indebted. I would now like to start with some music. Hmm. Yeah. Kurdish music can no longer be erased from our ears. This is how Mr. Ömer, an Armenian from Sassun, spoke about Kurdish music. He told me about the weddings they celebrate, he and the Armenian community he is part of. They are migrants from Eastern Turkey and have lived in Istanbul since the 80s and 90s. In Istanbul, they have more opportunities to connect to their Armenian identity. Some go to church or send their children to Armenian schools. But they still invite Kurdish wedding bands to play at their weddings. And Mr. Ömer said they generally listen to Kurdish music. The mu music we just heard was a Kurdish song about an Armenian woman who loves a Kurdish runaway who escaped to the mountains. In this paper, I investigate how Armenians from Sassun relate to their Armenian heritage through music and to other identities they feel connected to. Music is a powerful tool to express feelings of belonging, nostalgia, and desire. However, in the case of Armenian, Armenians living in Turkey, 
Musical expressions and memories were disrupted and suppressed by the consequences of the genocide. How do these people experience the lack of Armenian musical practices and the replacement of it with other music and cultural expression? This paper results from my PhD research on Kurdish folk poets. As my entrance into, uh, into this topic has been through Kurdish folk music, I first shortly outlined the ways in which Armenian emerge in that music. After that, I have some notes on the situations of, Ar uh, of Armenians from Sassoon. In the second part of the presentation, I discuss the story of one individual in detail, a Kurdish Dengbeth Bej with Armenian roots. Unlike the Turkish state approach in which Armenians and their history were totally silenced, the Kurdish approach has been a different one. During my research, it struck me that Armenian history was so strongly present in Kurdish collective memory, as also others have noted. If we look specifically at Kurdish folk music, then Armenians emerge in several ways. As a topic of the songs, in the memories of individual Dengbesh, uh, as Armenians who are now Kurdish Dengbesh, and through Radio Yerevan, the Kurdish radio station broadcast from Armenia. I suggest that Armenians in this context are often mobilized by Kurds to support Kurdish interests. And I will give one example, the song Metran Isa. It is a famous song. In short, the story goes like this. Miriam is the daughter of a wealthy church minister living in the city of one and was promised to become the wife of Sarkis, an Armenian man. But one day, the local governor fell in love with her. He sent a message to her parents, warning anyone interested to stay out of her way. However, as time passed by, the governor did not undertake any action to arrange the wedding. Fed up with waiting, Miriam sends a message to the governor, saying that he should either marry with her or leave her alone. When in the end the governor uh, sent his most trustable commander, Eli, to get her, uh, Miriam falls in love with him and wants to marry him instead. Eli is a Kurd. Uh, she asks Eli to escape with her to the Akhtamar church in the Van Lake. When they arrive there, the bishop of the church take them, takes them in protection. Eli asks the bishop to marry them, if possible, according to our, uh, Islamic customs. The bishop replies, I will never let this issue interfere with Muhammad's religion. I will, under the word of God and the hadith of Allah's prophet, marry the Christian Miriam and you. Instead of insisting on a Christian wedding, the bishop supports Islam. Also, he resists the governor, whose forces are not strong enough to attack the bishop. Both deeds give him a great reputation among the Muslims in the region. The song ends in disaster for the Christians and their church. The bishop renounces his faith by throwing his cap on the floor and blowing the roof of the church. At first sight, it looks as if this song is supportive of Armenian heritage. The bishop and the church are praised extensively. But on a closer look, the song does something else. It reverses the usual power relations. Miriam chooses to marry a Kurd. The bishop, on his own initiative, marries them according to Islamic customs. By turning the Armenian other into figures supporting them, the, the supporting Kurds, the song thus reinforces the position of Sunni Muslim men who wish to marry Armenian women. I will now continue to tell something about Sassoon, the region where I want to speak about today. Sassoon is a region close to Batman in eastern Turkey with a strong history of resistance. In the 16th century, it was incorporated into the Ottoman Empire. Until the late 19th century, it was a federation of Armenian villages with a high level of independence. 
The, um, one source uh, mentions the following uh, numbers of uh, the situation in 1914. But then after the uh, genocide, most Armenians had been killed or had left the region. In spite of the previously strong Armenian presen presence in the Sasun region and the high level of our organization, for those who remained in Turkey, the genocide meant an almost total erasure of Armenian identity. The picture I got from the interviews is that most of the times, the survivors were adopted in Kurdish or Arabic tribes, and the far majority converted to Islam. The language of communication be became Kurdish or Arabic. Even though the people were now Muslim in name, some continued to follow Christian customs. Once a year, or once in two years, a priest came from Diyarbakir or other places and performed Christian rituals. For example, in the 1950s, uh, Mr. Ilan says, there was a Syriani priest in Baran, and the priest from Baran baptized the children of the, of the village Herent, but they did it in hiding in the night. Although some Christian rituals were still carried out secretly, Mr. Ilhan said that he did not know much about Christianity or Christian culture. During the massacres, many churches had been destroyed or were left behind in ruin. In the 50s and 60s, mosques were built. Mr. Ilhan said, later we built a mosque on top of the church with our own means. With the money of that time, it was 60,000 lira. Whether we get blessings from the mosque or the church, it doesn't matter. Let God decide. Kurds, as well as Armenians, generally spoke positively about the context with their neighbors. They celebrated weddings together, and there were intermarriages. It didn't make a difference if someone was a Muslim or an Armenian. Everyone danced together. And most of the, uh, the songs also on, uh, on those weddings were sung in, in Kurdish. Uh, there were also songs in Armenian, but they were not performed much anymore. Kurdish became the main language for, for songs, even for those people who didn't understand them very well, because they spoke Arabic. Before the uh, genocide, Armenian, Arabic and Kurdish were all spoken in Sassoon. Mr. Ilan mentioned that many Kurds knew Armenian, and many Armenians knew Kurdish. He still remembered Kurds who spoke Armenian fluently. He also remembered that there were many Armenian wedding songs, which I already said. Several people spoke about Dengbej, Dengbej Amo, the son of Khajo. After he became a Muslim, his name was turned to Amr. He sang in Kurdish, but before the genocide, he also sang in Armenian. In short, within one generation, Armenian language and culture was almost completely erased from a region that before 1915 had numerous schools, churches, monasteries, and its own local rule. In this last part, I will tell the story of a Kurdish Dengbej, whom I call Jihan. His father was a survivor of the genocide. Jihan's life story is telling for how Armenian identity on the one hand disappeared almost entirely, but on the other hand could not be forgotten. Upon asking, Dengbej Jihan said that he is not a Faleh, an Armenian Christian, but a Kurd and a Muslim. It seems that early in his life he reconciled himself to his identity of Muslimin, of a Muslim with a Christian background and that in the first place he feels connected to this Kurdish identity. I suggest that by singing songs, he performs and reconfirms his Kurdish identity. Being a Kurdish Dengbej made him more part of where he wanted to belong. However, although he does not regard himself as an Armenian, in his story, Armenian memories continuously emerge. In this section, I focus on these Armenian memories. Born in 1925, Jihan was the eldest of the people I spoke with. He could understand some Turkish, but did not speak it. 
Most of his adult life, he lived in a village close to Kozluk. He was married and got nine children. He made a living from farming. And since 2004, he lives in Istanbul with one of his children, although he still often returns to his home region. Jihan's father, Aram, came from the village Parmis. Mr. Jihan told how Parmis had 1,050 registered villagers before the genocide. Only 50 of them survived. Aram fled to his aunt, who had married a Kurd and lived in the village Haure. In this village, he converted to Islam and married an Arab woman from the same region. They got one son, Jihan. When Jihan was eight years old, his mother left his father and married someone else. Soon thereafter, his father passed away. Re Jihan remained on his own. Until he was an adult, he moved from place to place and did not have much stability. When he was about 14, around the year 1939, he visited a Kurdish sheikh in Syria, a runaway who was sought after by the uh, Turkish government. When he was still in Turkey, Jihan had attended the sheikh's religious activities. He said, I prayed and I joined the zikr. He stayed with him for some time and sang for the sheikh as entertainment. These were Jihan's first singing activities. The episode with the sheikh shows that he was keen on belonging to that Kurdish life world. Still, he also felt connected to his Armenian background. He said about the time in Syria, at that time there were French in Syria, no Arabs. Their soldiers were also Kurmanji Kurdish. They were Falah. Like Deng Beşkarapete Khacho, he was from a village of Batman from Beleder. He said that he had been a soldier for the French for 15 years. It seems that in spite of not seeing himself as an Armenian, he recognized something in these people he saw there that made him feel connected to them. The soldiers were Falah, and Deng Beşkarapete Khacho he, he was speaking about was a Dengbej and a Muslim like himself. Jihan also said that he knew about relatives in Armenia. Fifty years ago, a letter came with the name of my father. It said, come, but I did not go. I lived with my father-in-law, I didn't go, I didn't care of it. Dengbej Jihan distanced himself from the relatives he appeared to have in Yerevan. He seems to have been too much occupied with the life he lived and obviously also satisfied with it. It is clear from his account that he did not feel the slightest interest in going there. When Jihan was in his late teens, he got acquainted with an ara of a nearby village. Mm. Where was I? The Aga turned out to be a, a distant relative. He was the son of an Armenian woman who had been kidnapped by a Kurd. Because of this relationship, the Aga invited Jihan to stay at his house and work for him. And he also married him to one of his daughters. In the house of this Aga, Hamel, Jihan learned to be a Dengbej. The Aga invited Dengbej from many places to come to his house and Jihan heard many performances. When I asked him if he also remembered female Dengbej from that time, he replied, there was a woman Dengbej from Herend, from the village Herend, she was a Christian. She was kidnapped by a Muslim. And when she left, left him, she became a Christian again. See, she came to our house and stayed for a month with us at the house of my wife's father. From Jihan's story, we understand that the Muslimin of Sassoon formed a support network that continued to function long after the genocide. Hanno Aga used his position to protect women like Gheme and did so more often. Although he was primarily a Kurdish Aga, he functioned as a contact for Armenians as well. Dengbej Jihan also benefited from the Aga's position. The latter helped him to establish a family life after his quite unstable younger years. Through him, he found a job, a village, and a marriage partner. 
At the same time, he had the chance to learn to be a dengbej. Until today, Dengbej Jihan primarily identifies with his Kurdish environment, even though the Armenian memories are also a sound part of his life. From Jihan's children, I understood that their Armenian roots were not forgotten by other people. People around them told them that they were Bafale, children of an Armenian. Although today most of Jihan's children dominantly identify with their Kurdish identity, the youngest children and grandchildren also began, re began rediscovering their Armenian identity. As a conclusion, I shortly want to return to the story Metron Isa. When I asked Mr. Jihan if the end of the song in which the bishop converted to Islam was indeed the correct version, he confidently agreed on this ending. He smiled broadly and said that indeed, the bishop had converted and blown the roof of the church. To him, the bishop's conversion was not problematic. Instead, it was an identity he felt connected to, and it supported his own life story. This does not mean that he denied the story of the genocide. Instead, he openly talked about these issues in detail and would refer to them whenever his mind brought him to such memories. To illustrate this point, I end this section with a story he told about Sassum. With, by ending this story with his own voice, I underline my conclusion that despite of the systematic erasure of Armenian identity in Turkey, the Armenian voice cannot be silenced and continues to sound through the words of a now Kurdish Dengbej. Mm. So I wanted to let you listen to his voice, but I didn't manage. On top of the Marata there is a church. In the time of the Falech, they brought a number of monastery students to this church. They placed 20 shamas in the church, and they stayed there all winter. When spring came, they found out that they were all dead. Before they died, they had written on a paper that they did not die because of the shortage of bread or water, but because of the wind and the fear of God. That is the hearsay about the church on the Mereto. I haven't seen it and I didn't go there, but that's what they say. Thank you. You must go to India. <laughs> I'm really dying to eat Unia <laughs> Yokumo, but uh, uh, not now. Of course, today we have uh, another two uh, very interesting papers to uh, hear, and now uh, it's Nevin's turn. Let me give you again some information about uh, Nevin Yildiz Tahin Joğlu. Uh, she was born in 1976 in Viranşehir district in Şanlıurfa. After completing her primary and secondary education in this city, she studied public relations and publicity in the Faculty of Communication at Selçuk University. In 1999, he, she was accepted to a master's program in journalism in Gazi University Institute of Social Sciences. Her uh, thesis uh, title was News about privatization in the Turkish press. Uh, she completed her PhD in journalism in Ankara University with a dissertation titled The Discursive Construction of Female Sexuality and Honor Killings on Honor in Şanlıurfa. This work was published as a book with the title State of Honor, Namusun Halleri. My res <laughs> her research topics are women exclusionary discourses in the media, cultural studies. She continues her work as a postdoc in Hugo Valentin Center for Migration and Minority Studies in Uppsala University. <laughs> As everyone has done, I'm going to tell you a story today. 
this story, as you may have heard, uh, there is this fact of the Hamidiyah regiments in uh, Turkey's history, and one of the founding Pasha, as uh, Ibrahim Pasha, lives in Viranshe here, and this is the uh, setting of the um, story. Sarah is the um, hero heroine of this uh, um, story. Sarah is a 15 or 16 year old girl who used to live in what this village which was used to be called Tel Jahfer. Together with the activity, when the activities of the Hamidiyah regiment starts, the Agas and the Pashas of the region were given the status of uh, commanders in Hamidiyah uh, regiments and they were given the duty of plundering Armenian villages. How do we know this? Well, I, I made a study of all history. I had four witnesses, and they did not want uh, their names to be cited, so they all have code names. I'm going to be telling you, um, giving you their testimonies verbatim, because they're so interesting at times. Three of these come from the family of Ibrahim Pasha. This uh, Aga is Ayib Aga, that's his name. He marries Sarah forcefully, forcibly, and these are the nieces of the of Ayib Aga. So this time the story is reconstructed by the next of kin, not of the victims, but of uh, the perpetrator. How do they see the situation, etc.? One of my witnesses is someone called Türkan, code name. She's in her 90s, and she's constantly in bed. Uh, she has afflicted with cancer. And she hates Ayyubara because of what he did to Sarah. Another uh, witness is, uh, another interviewee is um, a niece uh, of uh, Ayyubara who condones what Ayyubara did. And Ezidi is the third interview uh, who says that um, Ayyubara and Ibrahim Pasha really did very bad things to uh, Ezidis as well, not only to Armenians. Another interviewee had a grandmother who was forcibly converted to Islam, and so her story it was interlaced with the story of Sarah, and that was very interesting, the whole setup. Now, let me tell you the story. In this village called Konakiri now, was living with her family. She did not know that she was going to be the victim of these macro policies um, pursued by the Sultan. One day, these commanders of the um, Hamidiyah regiments were told that they could plunder Armenian villages. Now, Sarah at that time was very young. Because they weren't uh, put on the birth uh, register very uh, correctly at that time, uh, we don't know the ages exactly. The um, niece of Ayibaga tells us, Türkan, that Ayibaga and a cousin, Mustafa Aga, were called to Viran Shehir to be told to plunder Armenian villages. This Viran Shehir extends towards the uh, uh, Karajada, which is a mountain in the region. They could now uh, raid Armenian villages and plunder them. That these villages were raised. After a certain while, it was they were asked to uh, round up Armenian men and they were shut up in a cave, which is still called the Armenian cave. One day, Türkan uh, tells me, as Sarah told her, that 
when she was washing the laundry in the brook uh, near the river, she she sees an arm, a man's arm in the mouth of a dog, and sees that the arm has this wristwatch which belongs to her uncle. She goes to the cave and sees that all these men have been killed. The corpses are there and the dogs simply have um, torn up these corpses. She's 15 or 16 and goes undergoes a terrible trauma. Uh, Turkan says, I have seen so many traumas. But she was only crying when she was telling this story. Otherwise, she never cried. People sometimes ask questions. Why did Armenian women Islamize? Why did she accept? Why did they accept this, etc.? They can understand perhaps here. Many villages decide to run away after uh, this news uh, spreads. His name is Ayyub, but in local dialect they call him Ayyub, so that's why I call him Ayyub. Ayyub in Turkish means shame for our foreign uh, guests. We uh, there, there is a storage area into which people are put uh, without bread, without water, and then uh, Ayuba comes and sees them. Sarah has a brother who's five or six years old. All the interviewees concur on the fact that Sarah was a very beautiful young girl. Ayuba had two wives already, but fell in love immediately with Sarah as soon as he saw her. And you've got to marry me, he says. Sarah refuses. I will kill your parent, your mother, he says, and kills her mother. I will kill your father, and Sarah refuses, so he kills her father. But the younger brother... Um, uh, starts to weep and asks Sarah to uh, save him, uh, then Sarah accepts, but two, un, un, two conditions. You will not touch my brother and you will not, uh, I will not change my name. That name uh, really haunts Sarah, Sa Sarah all throughout her life. Because the powerful family of the Aga all think that she is not a Muslim uh, because there can be no Muslim with that name, Sarah. The brother dies in a year, well, this in, a, in very suspicious conditions, the young brother. Ayuba constantly pressures her into changing her name and it, for her, to take off the cross that she carries around her neck. Sarah also objects to this. The interviewees, the, the one who is a niece of Ayibaga, and the person who, say, who has said, a woman who said that the Armenians deserve this. This is the kind of person we're talking about. She accepted finally that Ayuba really exerted immense pressure on Sarah. When we we went to play in the courtyard of uh, Ayubara's Konak, um, Sarah was yelling so powerful, forcefully because, well, Ayubara destroyed the family of Sarah, killed her parents. Sarah was a resistor, really. When you look at the whole story, she's 15 or 16 when uh, this thing happens. She's so powerful, so strong. And to these ruthless people, she resists. She's, she was raped day in, day out, because she did not accept to yield to Ayiba. And uh, Ayiba. also used her, his knife 
with with which it is said she, he killed many Armenians. Also, uh, she, she, he used this knife to uh, draw crosses um, when the um, knife, with uh, making the hot uh, the knife uh, red hot, uh, drew crosses on her bodies. Sarah bore 15 children, but very interestingly, none of these children survived. They died all in the same manner. There are two different uh, rumors here. One, Sarah. It is said, because these were from a Muslim man who killed her parents, killed her own children. Uh, this is the kind of uh, image about the Armenian. They, these Armenians even killed their own children. Some on interviewees said this. The second rumor is that the Kuma of Sarah, that is to say, the another wife of uh, Ayibara, killed all the children. Two of these children, Hamza and Aisha, People think that these children were poisoned when they were around 15 or 16 uh, because there were bubbles coming out of the uh, mouth and it was, they fell and died. This is a kind of resistance, what Sarah did, silence. She spoke very little. But after all of her children died, Ayibara, the, 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 the husband, um, is par becomes paralyzed and says only one thing. You killed, dried up my whole family. You killed my whole family, says Sarah. Uh, and uh, I left you Kurojak, which means that Ayibara, uh, uh, which means a man who has no offspring. Um, his his sons from his other wives also died. So Sarah, after Ayibaga die, dies, distributes all his belongings, all his wealth to uh, the poor. Sarah lives in the Tashkonak, the stone uh, mansion owned by Ayibaga um, on her own. She distributes everything. She doesn't want anything to remain behind from Ayibaga. But it is very tragic that her death comes at, well, because of, not at the hands, but because of uh, the next of kin of Ayiba. They go to a picnic spot at the in the region. Aslam Baba uh, is uh, a shrine in the region. They go uh, there and uh, perform the namaz, the prayer, the Muslim prayer, and nobody believed that she had converted into Islam. Well, she didn't change her name. She was carrying the cross. That's, they constantly talk about that. But when they ask her, they, she says she's a Muslim. Zainab, one of the interviews, and she has a very interesting story herself because uh, she, we learned during the interview that her grandmother had, uh, maternal grandmother, had uh, been converted into Islam forcibly. They say to Sarah, uh, why don't you perform the namaz if you're a Muslim here as well? Sarah um, really uh, objects because I haven't had ablutions, she says. Um, but finally, she seeds and performs the namaz. When she comes out, uh, Tukyan says she was all pale. She had a headache. Uh, she's taken to hospital. Um, she is paralyzed and then dies. That's the end of Sarah's story. But I would like to touch upon Zainab's story a bit. Both her mother and her grandmother are Armenians. Her villages are raided. This is a story within the story, so to speak. Her whole family are massacred. Her grandmother, that is to say, her own mother, 
are left is left alone with two sons. A Muslim family takes them in, but they say you have to convert because I will not keep under my roof an, Ar uh, an Armenian, a Christian. Uh, her mother uh, used to uh, pray five times a day. Her grandmother, because she loses her uh, memory, um, used to go around in her village looking for the church, crying all the time. Thank you. Let me add something else. I was, you know, I did not... Uh, all these bad people in the story are my family. Perhaps in, in my own name, let me say, we should talk about these, uh, perhaps we should confront these, the perpetrators as well. That is why I did this. This family is my family. Thank you, Nevin. It was very... Mm, we will uh, come to the last speaker. Unfortunately, uh, we have uh, bad news about Rubina. She had an accident and uh, uh, broke her leg. Oh, yeah. Uh, anyway, Arda is going to uh, present her paper. Uh, so uh, let's me, let me just give you a few words about Rubina. Mian. Uh, she did her PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Cultures from UCLA, uh, formerly a lecturer of Armenian language and literature, is currently a research associate at UCLA. Her major publications include Literary Responses to Catastrophe, a comparison of Armenian and Jewish experience, Armenia in sphere of relations between Armenian Revolutionary Federation and Bolsheviks, in the Armenian language translated and published in Russian, and those who continued living in Turkey after 1915, uh, the Armenian genocide in literature, perceptions of those who lived through the years of calamity, a series of textbooks in Armenian on the Armenian question for grades 10 to 12, and the comprehensive textbook of the history of Armenian question for high schools in Armenia. Now, Arda is going to present her paper. Dr. Pirumian was my professor at UCLA, so I'm honored to read her paper today. In my book, and those who continued living in Turkey after 1915, published in 2008, I tried to follow the metamorphosis of the concept of Armenianness after the 1915 genocide, and particularly dwelled upon Islamized Armenians. Pointedly, the title of the chapter specifically dealing with the issue of conversion to Islam in this book ends with a question mark. Muslim Armenians, a paradox? Indeed, this first scholarly encounter with the issue that is my formal research, aside from years-long observations and unsystematic readings about it, still left questions unanswered. The existence of Muslim Armenians remained a paradox for me, and their appellation an oxymoron. The two words, Armenian and Muslim, still presented an unlikely juxtaposition. Obviously, Armenian forced or voluntary conversion to Islam has had its precedence during centuries of Ottoman rule over historic Armenia and its indigenous Armenian population. In a paper titled, The Symbiotic Relationship Between Turks and Armenians, An Obstacle Against Healing and Reconciliation, I presented at the IAGS, International Association of Genocide Scholars Conference last June, I tried to define the parameters of the Turkish-Armenian relationship through time and their bearing over mutual perceptions, even self-identification. This relationship, I argued, was sealed at the outset with the initial contact on the battlefield and the terror spread within civil society. Thus, that of the conqueror and the conquered, and consequently the ruler and the ruled. 
It was shaped by governmental policies on minorities and sustained and reinforced by the societal perceptions and behavior di dictating the modus vivendi. Between these two groups of people, quite dissimilar in ethnicity, religion, culture, tradition, and history. In this overall relationship, Armenians came to see the Turks and the Kurds, who incidentally, until not very long ago, were not even considered a separate ethnic group, but were called Mountain Turks, as frightful evildoers. Likewise, Turks perceived Armenians as infidels, unbelievers, kafirs or gyavors, and slaves of the Muslims or rayas and falas. This psychological stereotyping prevailed through time and produced a false perception of national characteristics without focusing, as Carol McLuhan writes, on the role of the social constructions of aggression and obedience shaped by factors of historical, cultural, and social dimension. To avoid simplification of the equation in this relationship, I had to take into account the gradual rise of the Armenian traders since the 17th century, the financial and industrial magnets in the Ottoman Empire, the Amiras, Chelebis, and Khojas, and the sentiment of jealousy they prompted within Turkish officials and the society at large. This sentiment was often translated into hate and malevolence as an added ingredient in Turkish-Armenian relationship. In that paper, I discussed the period of the 18th and 19th centuries economic, political, and social decay of the empire. This period coincided with the Armenian cultural and political revival resulting in calls for reforms and desperate re resort to armed self-defense against the assailants. These actions were countered by increased pressure of Turkish iron fist to crush the voice of so-called rebellion, sporadic massacres, forced Islamization of groups of Armenians, and persecution of Armenian revolutionaries, the filthy prisons, the torture, the hangings. The Armenian popular culture of the period Songs, sayings, and anecdotes are manifestations of a complex collective psyche structured by fear, hatred, helplessness, frustration, and even vengefulness. In such a predicament, conversion to Islam of individuals, families, and even entire villages became a last resort to efface that source of the evil treatment, the fateful distance between Armenians and the ruling Muslim society. Armenian historiography mentioned occurrences of mass conversions, but did not follow up with the descendants to evaluate the outcome. The ethnic border closed on these Armenians. They were considered renegades and lost for the nation. Who talked about or remembered, until of course recently, the mass conversion of Hamshan Armenians? Ironically, however, it is obvious today that these incidents of conversions simply to overcome constant persecution or out of fear of a catastrophe, have developed into a process of true Islamization. The new religion has gradually taken root. Time and environmental conditions have made true believers of Islam out of many of these converts and generations born to them. The continuing extermination policy implemented in various forms against Armenians since Sultan Hamid II remember the Hamidian massacres of 1894 to 1996, culminated in the massacres and deportations beginning in 1915. Conversion to Islam was there as an option to avoid certain death sentence. If not certain death, but continued discriminations and persecutions in the Republican era also compelled conversion, true or pretended. In the result of these forced or voluntary conversions, we are faced today with hundreds of thousands and maybe more of Muslims with an or Armenian origin. They are the offspring of Turkified Armenian children taken into Muslim households or Turkish orphanages. Many of these children were old enough to remember their roots and reveal their identity later to their grandchildren or children. Abducted young women, kept in Muslim house as wives, concubines, or sex slaves, 
gave birth to generations with Armenian blood running in their veins. And they are a multitude. Fetia Chetin remembers an acquaintance of the family whose mother was also Armenian, saying, quote, in our region, there is hardly a family whose roots aren't from that, quote, corrupt race, end quote. There is no one whose race has remained unspoiled. Altogether, Muslim Armenians, true or hidden, or Turks and Kurds and Alawites, with a trace of Armenianness in their ancestry, represent a sizable element in Turkish society. This element, long ignored or suppressed for the sake of pretending homogeneity, has become an issue in recent years and is gaining momentum. The identity of these meleses, hybrids, their sentiments, fears, and resentments have become a topic of engaged discussion thanks to Turkish modern thinkers and intellectuals in quest of their own identity, courageous Armenian activists, writers, and journalists, thanks to Hırat Dink's superhuman efforts. Change is underway in Turkey. Speaking about one's Armenian ancestry is less of a taboo today. Silence kept by Armenians who survived the genocide by converting to Islam is broken by the second and third generation born to these converts. They are coming out with the stories they were entrusted with, with the discovery they made in their family history, or because of the mere fact that they knew they were different, never fully accepted by the Muslim society, even by their immediate neighbors, and an un annoying qualifier, Mutedi, marked on their papers of identification and casting a suspicious shadow on their identity. The process of this self-revelation is painful to say the least. A person needs to define his or her identity not only in terms of purely personal attributes, gender, education, and other personal characteristics, but also in terms of group affiliation ethnic and cultural background, race, religion, language, that is mother tongue, and a common history with the group he or she feels affiliated with. Many Islamized Armenians, those aware of their origin, have difficulty defining their identity. Some do that by negation. Quote, we are not Armenians, we are not Turks, we are not Kurds, end quote. What are they left with? It is a puzzle in itself, a puzzle even for themselves. A fourth generation, the young and educated, living in this relatively more relaxed atmosphere in Turkey, is not satisfied with this ambiguous definition that impacts the shaping of their identity. And the problem is that the government's minority policies do not leave a niche. The monikers persist, Mutedi, Gavur, Gavur Oglu Gavur, a brat of a renegade, Gavur Vijvatsk, we are outcasts from every side, confides a 17-year-old girl whose great-grandparents, survivors of genocide, had converted to Islam and saved. She says, our family is called Gavur by Turks and Dajik by Armenians because we were not deported. We converted to Islam and today we do not speak Armenian. She is dreaded by her classmates' hatred toward her kind. She listens to their boasting to the fact that their ancestors killed Armenians and believe that whoever kills seven Armenians will go to heaven. The thought that if they are told the same today, they would not shun killing seven Armenians to secure their place in heaven devastates her. Defining one's own national identity is more confusing and complicated for Haji Ibrahim, who is a devoted Muslim living in Germany. He says, my mother tongue is Kurdish. I feel myself as a Kurd. I am Armenian by origin. My parents are true Armenians. I grew up in a Kurdish village. I don't know a word of Armenian. And when Germans ask my identity and my nationality, I answer, I am from Turkey. My mother tongue is Kurdish. My identity is Armenian. My religion is Islam. 
How many people of Turkey's 70 million population experience this identity crisis brought about by the cascade effect of resurfaced ancestral histories? The state's prescribed identity, together with the whole array of elements constituting the idea of Turkishness and Turkish identity, is being seriously questioned today. I strongly believe that this recently surfaced identity crisis is the result of centuries of intolerance shaping the state's minority policies, which ironically works against the state's own continuing policy of Turkification and homogenization of Turkey. Imagine if the Islamized Armenians were accepted wholeheartedly by the state and the society and the race code, soy kodu, applied to non-Muslim minorities, a disgrace by itself, at least spared the Islamized Armenians if the converted survivors of the genocide were not looked upon as undeserved leftovers of the sword and were treated like a member of the big family of Islam. Imagine if they had not gone through such torturous discrimination and continuing persecution they would have undoubtedly been absorbed entirely, and that trace of Armenianness in their ancestry, remembered or forgotten, would not matter whatsoever. The paradox between racial and religious intolerance on the one hand, and the policy of forced homogenization or Turkification of Turkey on the other hand, has caused a crisis jeopardizing the concept of Turkishness, but also, with no less importance, Questionable is the rigid concept of Armenianness and Armenian identity. In my book, I try to analyze this new phenomenon using theories of identity vis-a-vis -vis traditional understandings of it. Regarding Armenian identity, I try to find a new answer to the question, who is an Armenian after all? A person who is born to Armenian parents, who belongs to the Armenian church, who speaks Armenian? Well, Muslim Armenians have lost two of these major components of Armenianness. Could they be considered Armenians? And if not, what then? Who is to judge their degree of Armenianness and include or exclude them if they themselves feel Armenian? I wrapped up my chapter on Islamized Armenians, ending up with another question mark in my conclusion. My research had led me to a very basic question. Is Armenian society ready to accept them, the Islamized Armenians, and take them under its wings? I still do not have an answer to this question. Contradicting statements I hear in various strata of Armenian secular and religious leadership and the society at large do not reflect a collective response. As to the reality prevailing in Turkey today, I believe that Turkey's only chance to become a modern country with a flourishing society is encapsulated in the struggle of individual thinkers to achieve a pl pluralist democracy in the country. In such a socio-political structure, Turkishness and the Turkish identity, as well as the imposing slogan of one nation, one language, one religion, would lose its colossal bearing in the shaping and thus the definition of the identity of the citizens of Turkey. Judging by deep-rooted popular mindsets, and despite even most drastic societal changes happening in the past 10 to 15 years, I can surmise that that goal is still far away and very hard to achieve. Let us not forget that not so long ago in 2004, Baskin Oran was accused and indicted for in, quote, insulting state institutions. Because of inflammatory statements in the Minority Report Rights Report, whose preparation he headed. One such intolerable slip in the report was the use of the term Turkieli, meaning people of or from Turkey, citizens of Turkey, rather than the term Turk, as a supra-identity disregarding racial or religious differences. With this presentation, I try to address the is issue of Islamized Armenians and the complications present today challenging not only the concept of Armenias, Armenianness or the multi-component Armenian identity, but challenging also the idea of Turkishness, 
the Turkish national identity as prescribed by the state. But my true objective is that more, is that more than this 20 minute presentation, my physical presence here in this land of both my longings and my nightmares, and my encounter with thinkers sharing my intellectual interests will shed some light on the issue at hand, but more importantly, will help to dissipate my fears and reservations to realize the pilgrimage I always dreamed, a pilgrimage to bring me into physical contact with the desecrated Armenian churches and the remains of the idyllic Armenian towns and villages described so vividly and with such painful yearning in hundreds of memoirs of survivors I read and the fiction and poetry permeated with the transmitted pain and longing by second, third, and even fourth generations of exiled Armenians. Thank you. Thank you, Arta. You really read well. Well, now the questions. I, we have about 20 minutes, so I can get questions. I see one hand over there. Yes? Yes? Um, first, thank you to uh, all of you. I think, um, in my opinion, today's panel so far have been very, very engaging. Um, so thanks. My question I want to direct to Wendy. Um, the song that you were talking about, Metronisa, was incredibly interesting. And I wonder if, uh, during your interviews, if you got a sense of the song's history. Um, I ask because, on the one hand, uh, the story of an Armenian falling in love with a Kurd is highly uh, unusual. Often Kurds being, I mean, the archetype, right, is nomadic and barbaric who steal Armenians. And certainly, I think an Armenian would, in this image, never, uh, I, I mean, uh, lower themselves the status of falling in love with someone like this. And I wonder then uh, whether the story itself is realistic and whether pre-1915 or what have you, if it was sung kind of uh, within, uh, in an ironic sense and understood differently than it's understood today by your interviewee. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, so it is difficult to uh, get to know something about the history of such songs. Uh, well, so the way I understood it, um, well, I, in the first place, I do think that it, it could happen that uh, Armenians and Kurds fell in love with each other, but uh, because, of course, there were many contacts and uh, there were mixed villages, there were weddings in which they, ce which they celebrated together. Uh, so, but I understood this this song indeed as a kind of uh, uh, an, a power reversal of, Arme of uh, Armenian Kurdish relations, in which the Kurds try to, uh, or, or the song maker tried to um, uh, to mobilize, like yeah, to try to un to to make a turn so that it would be acceptable for uh, a, a Kurd to marry an Armenian instead of the usual story in which uh, uh, Armenian women were, were often kidnapped, so. So. I have a question for Wendy. Although there's a tradition where, through which uh, all this has been transmitted from generation to generation, why are there no songs that really tell us about the genocide? What do you think on this? In, uh, Wendy, Wendy, this is a question for you. Since there is a tradition that transmits these experiences from generation to generation, why is there no song about the um, deportation in 1915? <laughs> such 
Ben böyle şey... There may be uh, such songs indeed. Uh, so I, th there's more research needed to, uh, t yeah, to see if, if such song exists. And there is also, of course also one thing that maybe if songs existed in the sense of uh, supporting the genocide, then they would not be acceptable today. So they might be silenced also. People may not come up with just such songs even if they knew them. I don't know where to start. There are so many things to say. I will be very brief on each of these. First of all, I'm going to answer the friend sitting next to me. Don't you uh, ever ask uh, how can an Armenian fall in love with a Kurd? There's no. This is out of the question. The Obje the aim of this kind of meeting is to eliminate this kind of prejudice. I would like to say the following. Raghav Zarakolo, as he said years ago, as a result of involuntary marriages, We are grandchildren who have been condemned to voluntarily become friends. The, one should not play plus royaliste que le roi. One should respect um, our mutual existence. Let us fall in love with each other. I don't think there are any problems. That's one. Secondly, There's a shortcoming in the, one of the stories. Virginia Sebastian, who works for the Genocide Museum in Yerevan, has a very special uh, piece of research on songs made uh, um, about the genocide both in Turkish and in Armenian. And I think it, this has been translated into Turkish, if I'm not mistaken. Thirdly, in order to contribute to our friend, Raghip Zarakolu, together with Kebab Jan and uh, myself, we carried out uh, public diplomacy work. Charles Aznavour, uh, and I was advisor for him, I went to him and I said, because in the French Parliament, we, I'm uh, organizing the Congress for uh, Turkish-Armenian uh, dialogue, but then th they were yelling as traitor, uh, uh, traitors about us on the streets. I went to Charles Navour, he listened to me, I said, I, un I understand what you're saying, and gave me a very special kind of lyrics. This is what it said. Letters to my dear Turkish letter. Just one letter, sorry. The speaker corrects himself. There is a thorn in your foot, and in my heart there is a thorn. Come, take that thorn off your foot and so that you can walk comfortably. Now, once you start walking comfortably, then you will have torn out the thorn from my heart and I will breathe comfortably. I will be relieved. And I'm going to sing this in Lyon, he said. And yes, on the basis of certain documents that I had presented to him, he says there are Islamized uh, Armenians and this is a wealth for us, he says. We, he said, and Shalazon is not anybody. Once again, the, the, the world, they put down the world map, 193 flags. He sang in all these countries. He is world renowned. And six months ago, Sergei Sarkisyan, the uh, president of the Republic of Armenia, as a result of our work, said the following. 
what whatever denomination or religion a person belongs to all the armenians will be embraced by us we are ready to do this but while i'm saying this i'm also saying something else when i go to uh, germany to frankfurt uh, to certain conferences some friends come to see us you know from the way they carry themselves uh, the their 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 the way they dress they, there's a nobility there is also a kind of shyness you talking like this but we came here we are armenians but muslims and the armenians here did not accept us so what did we do we're we're living with the kurds here they said this aloud there's always a diaspora is not a normal thing so there is this kind of limitation in the last analysis because in the diaspora people act with their feelings with their emotions all over the world but in Armenia people can think more logically at least there is the following Charles Navour a very a most renowned artist of the diaspora and on the other hand is the president of the republic of armenia as we accept this fact now if a person says they're armenian then whatever uh, denomination or religion they belong to we should embrace them as grandchildren born of marriages which are sometimes involuntary we have to be voluntary friends we are condemned to this evet ben de uh, yes the topic of islamized uh, armenians is really something that has been covered with such dense layers the hunting foundation is now um, really opening the door ajar to let the light in this is very good i do hope that the door will be wide open in the future uh, and the topic will come on the agenda fully and I do hope that these Armenians can experience their Armenianness in fullness. I would like to ask Nevin Hanum a question. I would like to congratulate her for her very courageous um, coming out with respect to her family. This is really bold and courageous. And. I do hope that this kind of opening up on the part of Nevin Hanum will open the, the pave the way for further uh, initiatives in this sense. The Milli tribe, Ibrahim Pasha, is from the Milli Ashiret, the Milli tribe. I, we are always curious about the role of the Milli tribe, Milli Ashiret, in the Armenian genocide. We would like to hear from you this role as uh, with your frankness. Well, I'm not a historian. I'm not an expert in this uh, area. I just want to tell you the story of my family story. I have a bad one. I'm sorry. But the Milli Ashiret, the tribe Milli, starting from um, my very scant information but there are so many specialists here I don't think it's right to talk about this um, Abdul Hamid uh, called I mean Ab Abdul Hamid's um, governess called my great great grandfathers and um, asked them to all order them to plunder Armenian villages and then later to displace them this was not meant to be an ethnic cleansing or a genocide, but it turned into ethnic cleansing. From what I hear from my family, Mustafa Pasha, for instance, Mustafa Aga, uh, who is the uncle of my mother, while he was uh, being educated at a military school there, then he was called by the Kaimakam, the uh, district governor. Uh, he came from Istanbul because he was ordered to come, and he was officially... Um, 
tasked uh, to uh, work in these Hamidiyya regiments. So they are local actors of a macro policy. They are they evacuate and plunder these villages, then they round up the men, they kill the men, the rest are displaced. Well, some of them elope themselves, but the others are displaced and they divide up their villages. Those who come to the Ayubara Konak are those that are his share of the plunder. A lot of my property, uh, the, the property of my family, belong to these people. We, this should be said very frankly. These were Armenian villages which were later Islamized, belonged to Kurds, and many of the surviving Armenians in Virashir. There is a very high Ezidi and Armenian population at that time. Because I'm so ignorant, I don't know this. But I would like to say something. Well, uh, there's a lot of uh, research done on the um, repression and suppression of Armenians in eastern Anatolia. Not uh, the, the Ufa um, area has not been researched into. People think it's around Malatya and Diyarbakir, etc. In Ufa, there is still um, um, neighborhoods which are called Gyawur uh, neighborhoods, that is to say, in neighborhood of the infidels. People say, uh, they say they're uh, from Urfa. They don't say they're Kurdish or whatever. You know, they suppress their religious and ethnic uh, identities and say they're from Urfa. The people in the, the Armenians from Viran Shehir, they were killed and uh, um, their property was taken away. And some of them, many of them converted, but their a conversion was not um, um, accepted as, vali as valid. And their uh, 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 fingers point on them and they say, these are Armenians, you know. So historiographical work is necessary here. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the whole panel. Very uh, mind-opening. I have a question for Jafar. Well, you usually work on different things. Mardin Diabakar, in different uh, meetings, we listen to him. And it's not Im the easy to research into one's family um, history. What kind of reaction did you receive from your family members? Were they angry with you or did they condone this? It was very instructive. Both Nevin and Jafer. When I told them that I was going to do research on uh, this kind of thing, my mother was very angry. Well, that was what was necessary at that time. That was, that's why it was done. My f if my father had been alive, uh, he would certainly not have permitted me to do this kind of thing, and I love him. Uh, now you're trying to make peace with the past of your family. It's a traumatic kind of experience. It's very saddening uh, to come from this kind of family, but then you love them. So this is the kind of bizarre situation you find yourself in. So we're really confronting ourselves. I think everyone should be able to do this. The, it's not sufficient for the victim to come out and say, I'm a victim. Everyone, uh, everyone says that they're victims in this country. And uh, the real victims and the pseudo-victims, are one, one can confuse, really. So the perpetrators should come forth and say, we are the perpetrators, and should confront themselves then we can really heal all the wounds. Because I come from a multicultural family, I wasn't really um, pressured when I was re researching into this. My grandmother is George, Georgian. My paternal grandmother is Circassian. Um, my grandfathers, I don't exactly know. Uh, but there are some people in my family um, who did say that you should not really justify Armenianness. Huh? Don't give them um, uh, any don't show them as if they were right. 
but I received a lot of support because I come from a multicultural family. If I did not did not come from a family in the Black Sea region, but from a family who claims that they're totally Turkish, then the doors would not be opened. Uh, perhaps my that grandmother's um, chest would not have been opened. The chest. What what is that chest? Some somebody says. Well, perhaps they wanted to hide something in that chest. That's why there was a heart on that. Why was she called Sandik? Because she did not want to say certain things. I think. Hello, Sergeant Shaperoğlu. In the presentation of Rubina Perumian, there was a sentence. If there were, if there was no uh, mistake in translation, I think this should be paid attention to because we've been discussing this. The Christian Armenians really adopt a superior language over m Muslim la uh, Armenians because everything that we're talking about here will be thrown to the thrash if that is the case. There should be no domination over these Muslim Armenians. We should resist this. And when we talk and when we uh, write, we should really pay attention to our language I don't think there is any relation, well, the sentence, the, there is, I, th I don't think um, um, uh, Armenians should be uh, distinct, uh, discriminated against e even if they're Muslims or Christians. Well, it's a matter of churches and mosques, but then um, I think cemeteries and schools can be shared, so I don't think this kind of language should be used. and. The, there should be no power uh, because Christians are controlling these uh, institutions nowadays. I think this is very important. Last question to you. Uh, 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 I am someone uh, whose parents are Christian Armenians. So this has to do with the political stance, not my own position in life. One or two, three, uh, one or two very brief observations. Perhaps people want to respond to this. Of course, we listen to very heartbreaking stories uh, in the previous panels as well. Also Nevin's story. It is very difficult to talk about these stories. We try to conceptualize things here, etc., but then it is very difficult. But let me give it a try. Remember all the women's stories that we talked about in the previous panel. We're talking about an immense kind of uh, barbarism, of violence, savagery, and there's, of course, a psychological dimension to it. And this is very important, and I feel very close at, my, uh, at heart to this, this kind of ad, uh, approach. But without bringing other things in, it's as if these stories are the result of the deeds of psychopaths. Well, there may be in a dimension like this. Uh, it's very difficult to assess this. But, and an immense violence exerted on these women and torture, and we can see reflections of this kind of attitude today as well in other examples. But perhaps one should in look into the reasons and the uh, results of this kind of violence. Perhaps one could take up a sociological kind of analysis or anthropolog anthropological kind of analysis. In your framework, uh, you constantly say the local uh, um, implementation of a macro policy. So the Kaimakam calls this person and they come from, his, uh, she, this person comes from his school in Istanbul. But these people are not puppets. What I want to say is the following. In the local uh, context, 
there must be something that must be a grounds for this kind of savagery, this kind of violence. One has to think and talk about this. I'm not saying that we should um, dump the other attitude approach, but there will be another kind of picture that would explain this kind of violence. Another uh, small observation. In previous panels as well, this was discussed. Aisha Gul also talked about this in the opening panel. Of course, the, the gender uh, dimension is very strikingly there. Women, of course, experience uh, this um, genocide in a more violence. Well, the speaker says, I don't know how who is exerted to more violence here, but take Sarah's story. Well, 15 of her children have died. Uh, one possibility, you said, was the f was Sarah killing them. Now, uh, Fethiye Chetin uh, talks about her grandmother killing her grandchildren, etc., each children, etc., but different uh, practices of motherhood. When we listen to this, we say, how can a mother do this? But this kind of motherhood thing is something else than... Uh, from what we think it is. It's like a sophist choice kind of situation. Uh, so perhaps uh, these stories are important for um, uh, this, uh, the anthrop these anthropologists working on India, uh, Lina Dastu, uh, Dasgupta, I think, I didn't hear the exact name, this uh, um, is the name, um, perhaps takes this kind of uh, question up. These people, uh, say they, they do not return to their community because they, they think that the Armenian community will not accept them with these children. But here there's something else. So there's something very complicated here on motherhood, which pushes us to think on motherhood from the sociological point of view. So at this point, I think we should leave aside the concept identity. Perhaps we should use other concepts here. Perhaps another kind of conceptualization would be more fitting. Perhaps more sophisticated conceptualizations because if we continue on the basis of the uh, concept identity, well, I have my reservations. This kind of essentialist attitude. What is Armenianness? What is Turkness? Perhaps the, the answer is not possible to give. At this point, I feel myself very prepared, very ready to leave behind the concept identity. And this last speaker really pointed to that. Some th an exercise like the following would be very interesting. Let us ban, well, perhaps not ban, but this concept identity, uh, leave aside this concept of identity. And how can, what other words can we use to talk about these? So, you went into a very serious academic kind of discussion. Of course, we establish this kind of framework when we write this uh, presentation, but we, I didn't want to, uh, you know, really talk about all of that during a 15 or 20 minute uh, presentation. I don't use the concept identity in my own work. Uh, I talk about practices in the process. Now, coming to motherhood, some, this is something that is the topic of a whole literature. I did not believe myself that Sarah killed her own children. This is a racist discourse that was generated because people thought that Armenians are sinister people. No, no, I'm saying that um, uh, perhaps Sarah could kill her children. And she, the, the speaker says, uh, Nevin says, yes, of course uh, um, she could. Motherhood is learned. There are so many different varieties of motherhoods and uh, the woman is an agent and she can establish all kinds of motherhoods, construct all kinds of motherhoods. So this is very much open to agitation. That's what Sarah's story is like. I was very moved when I was writing this. I skipped many things because I did not want to create a kind of impact, um, emotional impact. I also want to, to, to do that, but I don't want this reality to become a kind of um, 
elegy for victims. But this is inevitable. Uh, in my PhD, I worked on this kind of thing. People said such things, and I had to. Oh, I was working on uh, honor killings. She was knifed by her husband. She talked about it, and I had to transmit this. For an academic uh, text, of course, you have to be more careful. But while you're talking, you could be, you can be more emotional. Jafar is going to. Jafar. Then uh, you all go and have lunch. I will uh, cite an example uh, from Unye about what you said. An Armenian woman comes to Unye 30 years later. Uh, she left her uh, child when she was six. No, the child was six, but she's now 36. And the child, of course, the woman did not speak Armenian for 30 years, but she could. She can speak in Armenian uh, when the mother comes. Although she did not speak uh, Armenian for three decades, the mother wants to take the daughter to France together with her children. But the, uh, there's a choice to be made here. She, she had, has to choose between Armenianness, uh, uh, sorry, between religion and the uh, feeling of motherhood. She, her motherhood um, was preponderant, and she stayed in Unia. Well, motherhood could not, may not be like what we assume it to be, says um, Aifar Bartu. Uh, 